a safe and welcoming space to meet fellow queer people and celebrate pride away from the corporations, government and Gardaí. Uh, we're going to have a couple of speeches here, then we're going to invite you to relax and enjoy yourselves. And This is a stationary event, so there's going to be no need to move beyond the bridge, just for safety as well. So I'm just going to say a few words on behalf of Queer Action Ireland and why we're here. It's been a tough year to be queer. Between fascist attacks, queerphobic violence and the continued assault on the trans community from all angles, ongoing racially charged assaults, the centre ignoring everything and even those within our own community who pretend that none of the above exist, we're facing an epidemic of apathy and outright attacks, the likes of which we haven't seen in years. So I'd like to take a moment to thank you for showing up. In this world, it is an act of bravery to be openly queer and more so to pit yourself against the mainstream that wants you to, that wants you to assimilate and make you its own to turn you into just another number on its pages of statistics. And that's why we're here today. We're here because Pride, both worldwide and in Dublin, has become a marketing tool for corporations and capital. Instead of highlighting issues that impact our community, the parade's now awash with companies who want to cash in on our money. They see us as little more than a tool to make them appear woke, to attract more customers to whatever they're selling, or to distract from the fact that they're selling our information to companies and political parties who want to profit off us. We're here because, as an organisation, Dublin Pride is colluding and cooperating with Angarda Shiakona, who continue to attack our community. They assist in evictions, they jail sex workers, and they protect a government who does nothing for us except raise rents, protect landlords, and place corporate greed over the needs of the people of Ireland. They are the tools of an oppressive government, and they're marching in uniform is unacceptable when they have done little to change their unjust treatment of the LGBTQ plus people since they ignored the murder of Declan Flynn nearly 40 years ago. It's your money that the system is tilted to suit them, and their state-sanctioned violence against us will continue unless you bring about an act of change, and soon. We're here because the official media partner for Dublin Pride this year is RTE, who only a few months ago platformed a transphobic hate speech, whose mandate is to present all sides of every debate, and has surely contributed to the spread of queerphobic rhetoric across the island of, Ar the island of Ireland, who continue to allow every hack with a dangerous and life-threatening opinion on the airwaves. We're here because we cannot stomach marching beside Airbnb, who are taking our houses and contributing to the huge homelessness crisis, caring little when we're thrown into the streets so another landlord can make a profit. We can't march beside Amazon, who continue to treat their workers with frightening disregard, putting their lives and livelihoods in danger to deliver and consume more and more and more. We cannot march beside Google or YouTube because they refuse to monetize LGBTQ plus creators and their algorithms open up avenues of attack to the most vulnerable in society. We can't march beside the litany of corporations who only seek to profit from us and have no desire to actually help our community. Corporations do not care about us, they only care about profit. We're here because we still don't have sufficient fucking health care for trans people. We're here because homelessness impacts LGBTQ plus people disproportionately and nothing is said or done about it. We're here because our friends, our chosen family, people we know and love are still getting the shit kicked out of them all over the country for being themselves. Because the right is rising, still, looking to deny us every right that we in our forebears have fought tooth and nail for. We're here because this kicked off 50 years ago at Stonewall Inn in a hail of bricks and bottles. Is this what it was for? So the police could march their rainbow cars down the street pretending they don't attack us the other 364 days of the year. So corporations can profit after years of suffering and piles of dead bodies that represent the fight for queer rights. So Leah Redkirk is standing in his ivory chair and saying, yes, we are a very progressive nation, while free people suffer the consequences of his complacent and dangerous politics below. Dublin Pride is unacceptable in its current form, and we're fed up with it. We're delighted to see so many people here today who can see it for what it is, a marketing ploy, a money-making exercise, a gloss over an injustice system that exploits us for one month of the year and then chooses to forget we exist for the rest. Today we're here as the, in the original spirit of pride. We're here to bring attention to the issues that impact us as a community, to raise each other up, to act as allies for each other, and then go out into the world and take action to change it for the better for queer people everywhere. It's been a tough year to be queer, and in the midst of it all, we've lost some truly amazing people, including important icons like John Hanna, and those who deserve better at the hands of our state like Silva Takula. I'd like to invite you all to join us in a minute's silence and honour them and remember the others that we've lost.
Thanks, Scott. Um, just to make everyone aware, the guards have been telling people that past that this is an anti-LGBTQ parade, so just to make sure that you're all aware of that. Perspective of a young LGBT organiser from QAI whose first pride is today. Um, and then we're going to move on to the various grassroots groups and most of them have actually marched with us in the Pride over the last six years. Um, so I'm going to hand you over to Izzy first, who's one of the co-founders of Dublin Pride. Uh, you can tell I've been doing this since before we had any um, speakers or mics or anything like that to help us out. So uh, it's probably going to die on me now just, to, just to, uh, to get back at me for saying that. I want to introduce you to Aoife. Here's Aoife. It's... And today is Aoife's first bride. <laughs> and she is in absolutely the right place. Yeah? This is the place to be. Uh, so I've been uh, lucky enough to, to uh, be that person. I've had, I don't know, about a dozen first prides at this stage. I told you it would die. I've had about a dozen first prides at this stage. And this is yet another one. And uh, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm also in absolutely the right place. Now... The most important place to be on Pride, because Pride is still very important. And the most important place to be is not at the biggest Pride, the most glamorous Pride, the best funded Pride, the Pride with the most floats, the most balloons, uh, the most drag queens, whatever it is. That is not the important place to be. The important place to be is where people are claiming this right for the first time. Where people are coming out and claiming the right to be themselves in the streets of their city, their town, their village for the first time. Yeah? I, I was... I was privileged uh, a few months after I came out in 1983 to be one of the people who marched through the streets of Dublin uh, after Declan Flynn's murderers got freed by a court. We marched to Fairview Park. People talk about it now called the Fairview Park March. I was 20 years old. And it was one thing that I ever did in my life. And one of the things that has really upset me over the years is when people refer to this as the first Pride. Because Pride is something else, right? We were scared that day. Uh, we were frightened. We were uh, mourning uh, the loss of an individual, but also how little value our lives had. How little value the country that we lived in attached to our lives that these guys could walk free after what they did. Oh. Hey. 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 Oh. Oh. This is so much better. We're going to... Hey. Hey. I've actually, I think I've got a picture of myself of one of these every year for the last 36 years. Right. Well, it's going to make the most flat slideshow at my funeral. I hope there are <laughs> Anyway, um, I was privileged to be to be in that crowd and it was anything but a pride parade. I remember it was a march, it was cold. I remember the upturned colours and the scarves pulled up over the noses and the hats pulled down over the eyes. Are you hiya <laughs> are you saying that you can't hear me? Oh okay there, there are people saying that they can't hear me. Is it oh, better if I do it like this? Because I think maybe this distorts a little bit. So I'm just going to shout. I'm just going to lose my voice one more time for pride. Okay? Yeah. Three, yeah. Months, three months later, folks, some of you, some people aren't going to be as comfortable with shouting as me. So you better get something together for it. This week is coming on next. I don't know if you're quite up to this, but we give it a shot, right? Okay, 
three months later, we really did have Dublin's first Pride, uh, which was a wonderful occasion, a much more light-hearted occasion, but it was a couple of hundred of us, and it was the first time that it was done, and the first time is important, right? Uh, there were three of those Pride marches in the 80s, and each one was smaller than the last. There were a number of reasons for that. For one thing, people in the community, the, the very small activist community that was available you know, to do work in those days, the people who were prepared to do this kind of work, got, got absorbed into providing services that the state was not prepared to provide for members of our community who had HIV. That is the story of the late 80s and the early 90s in LGBT activism in Ireland. The other thing that was going on was there was violence when we, when we took to the streets. There were assaults on us and nobody defended us. The police didn't defend us. Nobody defended us. The big corporations were not interested in selling us stuff yet. We had to do this stuff for ourselves, yeah? So Pride stopped happening in the, in the late 80s in Dublin. And in 1992, I was one of a handful of people who said it's time to do this again on the streets of Dublin. And we had another first. And another couple of hundred people came out very bravely, but with much more cheer and, and much more high spirit because the times were changing. And we were winning battles. We were winning battles by this stage instead of losing them. Decriminalization was still two years in the future. Um, the uh, attrition rate from HIV was still extremely high. Uh, but we, we were growing confident in our own power. It's a long way from that day to this day. And all kinds of other firsts have happened along the way. I was fortunate enough to be one of the people who founded Northwest Pride, a determinedly uh, anti corporate community. <laughs> did that from 2006 to 2015 it was another first one more time we were marching in somewhere where people said you can't do that here if we want to do that we'll go to dublin when we did it in dublin people said if you want if we want to do that we'll go to london we'll go somewhere else and we've always said no we have to do it right here in right dublin here, where we are right here right <laughs> Today we have to be right here on Rosie Hackett Bridge. Am I talking for too long? <laughs> no, you could never yeah. talk for too long. Thank you. Today we have to be right here on Rosie Hackett Bridge and we have to be right here at the same time as Dublin Pride is walking past. I know there are people who have said that we should be doing it at some other time so that people can be on both and stuff, but it is actually important if we do that, we are seeding this weekend. We are saying that this weekend belongs to the corporations and we are allowing ourselves to get pushed into something else. This weekend does not belong to the corporations. This weekend belongs to us. Yeah. I am speaking too long, but I'm still going to do it for another minute or two. Is it good? Um, I just think we are, it has been mentioned in the previous speech, we're living in very dangerous and difficult times and our enemies are rising. Uh, all over the world this is happening and it's yeah, crazy it that at the same time as our enemies are rising, there are people within the LGBT community who are trying to tell us that everything is all right because a bunch of corporations put rainbow stripes on their logos for a month, you know? This is not all right. This is the cheapest PR that anybody can ever do, right? They can drop a banner down the front of their building. They can paint rainbow stripes on their Facebook profile or their Twitter profile. And they can tell you that they're inclusive now and they're fighting for us. And they are not fighting for us and they have never fought for us. And over the years, ahead of us, they are going to abandon us. Nothing is surer because the wind of change is happening and it is no longer going to be to their benefit to stand by us. And the people who will stand by us are the same people who stood by us 
in 1969 in the Stonewall Inn, which is that <laughs> and excluded members of our community. That is who will always, always fight the fight. Now, a very important first pride that happened last year, because I do think I'm always keeping an eye out for where is this happening for the first time. And one of the very important places where pride happened for the first time last year was in a, a refugee camp. I apologize for my pronunciation if it's, if it's incorrect. In, in Kenya, which I think is called Kukula, and it is a... Kukula. Kukula, thank you. And it is a, 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 a city, essentially, at this stage, of 185,000 people. And 600 LGBT people in the Kukula refugee camp uh, had their first pride. Yeah. Okay, now I am talking too long. <laughs> what happened? Uh, 600, 600 people in the Kukula refugee camp marched for the first time. And we need to remember, part of what we need to remember when we're standing here, is that people just like us are still being driven out of their homes. And people just like us are embarking on dangerous journeys to other parts of the world, searching for freedom. And there are people who are trying to tell them that this freedom comes with um, <coughs> This freedom comes with uh, the, the, the sponsorship of global, global corporations. And that's not where the freedom comes from. The freedom comes from people like us, right here. Now we have to fight for those people. We have to fight for those people who are trying to celebrate their pride in refugee camps, who are getting to this country and are being incarcerated in direct provision centers. And we have to say, this is the heart of our community. These people are the heart of our community. And there are people who are weaponizing the existence of trans people and the existence of migrants against us. Um, and part of what we're doing by being here today is saying you never do that. One thing, there was one question I was asked to answer when I was asked to speak here today. And that was about whether we had links back in the old days with things like the Gay Liberation Front. We knew those things were happening because we read the gay press and the women's press, but there was no internet. And I remember like we had one international contact in a Dublin Pride that I was involved in once, which involved making a phone call to New York to the uh, brave, um, our brave comrades in the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization who were trying to queer up the St. Patrick's Day Parade in, in New York. <laughs> around and somebody had to purchase an international phone card and somebody had to walk into town in the middle of the night to take this phone call or to make this phone call. So we had very, very little contact with groups in other countries, but we always knew that we were part of an international movement. We always knew that we were part of an international community and that our community transcends borders. Now, we have much easier access to that news. We see it as it happens. We know that two years ago in Toronto, I think it's two years ago, Black Lives Matter protesters sat in the road and prevented the Pride Parade from passing because of the participation of police who did not respect their lives and their well-being. And today we are part of that movement. The only thing, I, I absolutely understand people who want to march in this parade. I feel no hostility to people who march in this parade. Everything we do, us here and them there, is being seen by lonely children in their bedrooms, looking out and saying, somewhere out there, there are people like us. I want this to show respect to all of us, and I agree with what's being said about the community groups that are leading the parade. But there is one thing that I want to tell you, and that is 20 years from now, or 30 years from now, this is going to be like the GPO in 1916, because half the people that are marching past there today are going to tell you they were here. <laughs>
her first Pride and she's a member of QAI. Hi everyone! Hi. Hi. Um, so mine won't be quite as long. I'll, I'll um, <laughs> I have one tiny page. And um, this is my first Pride, as you were told. Um, so I struggled with my identity for as long as I can remember. If you can't see by my um, my bisexual flag cape, um, I was constantly told it was just a phase. I'm confused. You'll end up marrying a man anyway, so what's the point? Um, well, I, I, you know, I stood my ground. I had some internal struggle, but I'm here. Um, and I was really looking forward to my first pride. Um, to get my day in the sun, to be a visible part of my own community. Um, I always thought that LGBTQ pride was about a celebration of visibility, as well as taking political action, highlighting all the queer issues that we're faced with. I soon realized that Dublin Pride would not provide that for me especially when I joined QAI, we were going to march. We all kind of sat there, we were like, well, do you do you want to? Well, well I don't really want to, uh, now we're here. Um, Dublin Pride wants civilians to stay in the shadows, visibility given to profit, individuals lost between corporations, banks, and now the fucking Gardaí. I thought... Yeah. <laughs> I thought the pride would be the light at the end of my tunnel. Instead, the light is here on this bridge. My community is here, not in the parade. There are only eight of us leading Queer Action Ireland at the moment. But there were only eight people at the 1974 LGBT protest in Dublin. And they, they paved the way for decriminalization. They made waves, and so can we. Thank you! Give it up for Aoife! Uh, Budalani has protested since his high school days when he had to march for textbooks and better school infrastructure. Growing up in an apartheid ghetto, Kyalitja in Cape Town, he soon realised that he'd have to protest for access to land, adequate housing, healthcare and improved policing. He served on numerous community forums in Kyalitja, including the Kyalitja Health Forum, Neighbourhood Watch, and as a branch secretary for the Democratic Alliance. But Alani left his native South Africa due to targeted killings of LGBT plus people where he lived and sought protection in Ireland. While living in direct provision, Budalani got involved with Massey, the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland, where he is campaigning for the right to work for all asylum seekers, to end direct provision and regularisation for undocumented people in Ireland. So give it up for Budalani. <laughs> I have a very soft voice, so I'll please ask you, if you cannot hear me, just raise your hand, uh, then I'll try to speak up. <laughs> uh, many decades ago, queer bodies revolted against police raids in New York City. They were tired of having to live their lives in the shadows, hiding from the police, who sought to control how people lived. They had decided that the state violence unleashed against them, for being who they are, must end. And so they took direct action to end it. This would be known as the Stonewall Riots, which marked the beginning of the movement for LGBT, for the liberation of LGBT plus people around the world, for many countries. It was direct action sparked by police enforcing the criminalization of anyone who wasn't cisgendered and heterosexual. On the streets of Dublin today, police officers from the very institution that brutalized LGBT plus people in Ireland will march at the Pride Parade. Dublin Pride asks us to march along them the very same institution that has been used to, in, to unleash violence against people of our own, our, our own people. Masi, the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland, made the decision not to march at Pride, at Dublin Pride today. We marched last year, I spoke at Dublin Pride last year, well, I'm not there anymore. <laughs> Not just because the police are marching today, but because Dublin Pride has lost the very essence of pride. If not used for brand marketing, it is used by politicians who pretend to care about LGBT plus people in the state. But we know how they treat us. Massey, the movement of asylum seekers in Ireland, was left bewildered when the Department of Justice and Equality raised the rainbow flag in their building, marking the beginning of pride festivities, not a protest. 
Then the Department of Justice said they would pay for asylum seekers to travel to Dublin Pride. Marcy was left bewildered because this is the same Department of Justice that asked LGBT plus people to prove their sexual orientation when claiming asylum in Ireland. They are not only cruel to asylum seekers in general who are warehoused in the abhorrent system of direct provision, they dehumanized asylum seekers by asking very personal and private intimate details about their sex life. When did you have your first same sex experience? How did you feel about it? Who was it with? And they've told, they've gone as far as telling a, a queer woman from Zimbabwe that she doesn't look like a lesbian. Can anybody here describe for me what a lesbian looks like? Like what? Beautiful. We're on. The she Department of Justice recently rejected an asylum claim because the applicant was not ashamed enough of her sexual orientation. She'll be marching at Pride today. They said it was put to the applicant that her experience of having feelings of someone of the same sex, when it is frowned upon, would have feelings of shame and difference, which it was submitted did not align with what the applicant was submitting was her experience. So she couldn't possibly be queer and proud. She had to be ashamed just because she's queer. They didn't understand why she was proud of being queer in a, in a country where um, she should be proud. LGBT plus people are criminalized. Well, if you look into the history of pride everywhere in the world, people who marched at pride were people who were proud and queer. <laughs> the Department of Justice and Equality has also told the asylum seekers they don't look gay. People are forced to appeal decisions. Even in the appeals tribunal, they must be asked to approve to approve their sexual orientation. Marcy received a letter from a solicitor representing an asylum seeker asking us to write a confirmation letter that the person has participated in our LGBT plus uh, meetings. We had a meeting in, uh, in Limerick because there were a lot of asylum seekers who experienced uh, homophobia in direct provision. So we, we wanted to find out how, how widespread the problem was in the center. And we had that meeting. And so apparently ngos in ireland have been doing that for a long time for decades they've been writing letters to confirm that a person belongs to that lgbt plus group as if to say that we declare we verify that this person is actually queer we find that to be inhumane and dehumanizing and ngos established ngos like the irish refugee council lgbt ireland need to stop that practice and condemn the department of justice for doing so So Masi is here today because it's a group formed by marginalized people who have been or are going through the asylum system and pride was started by marginalized people. I'm here today as a black gay asylum seeking migrant because I cannot march at Dublin Pride with the same police officers who could snatch me and deport me back to my country. It is the same police officers who could stop and search me. They have done so on O'Connell Street. It is the same police officers who brutalize black people in Ireland. We've seen a lot of videos where they actually attacked, they attacked uh, a, a black woman from South Africa. They pinned her down. It was four officers against one black woman. They've danced the same with a black teenage boy. So we cannot, it, I feel as a black person uncomfortable marching along with them. Marcy is here today because the police are an agency in the very same Department of Justice that treats asylum seekers as if we are less human. We are here today because we need more than rainbow flags from the Department of Justice. We are here to demand the complete overhaul in the way asylum seekers are treated in Ireland. And that starts with abolishing their dehumanizing, cruel, and a, uh, a direct pro system of direct provision and stopping deportation and regularization of undocumented people in Ireland who have lived here for many, many years in the shadows of the Irish state. All power! All power! All power! All power! Amanda! Amanda! Thank you. Thanks, workers. And as recently as 2010, sex workers were banned from marching in Dublin Pride. Thank you. Hi, my name. <laughs> Hi, my name's Carol Trian. I'm a board member with the Sex Workers Alliance Ireland. I'm also vice chair of Tenny, the Transgender Equality Network Ireland. 
Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that 50 years and one day ago, on the 28th of June 1969, there was a riot on Christopher Street in New York. And that's why we're here. We're not here because of some... Because Google decided we're going to have... We're going to sponsor a riot at the Stonewall Inn. It was because some trans people, some trans sex workers and trans women of colour helped start a riot. Six, three years before that, there was another one in the Compton Cafeteria riots in San Francisco, where again, a group of trans sex workers, people of colour, said, we've had enough. We're the canaries in the coal mine. We're facing the worst abuse, the worst harassment, the worst police discrimination of anyone in the community. And they reached their breaking point. And 50 years later, what's changed for the community as a whole and what's changed for people like that, the people who started the Stonewall riots? A lot's changed generally. We have marriage equality, we have gender recognition, we have a lot of other improvements. But if you're a trans woman who's a person of color and a sex worker in Ireland today, what's different for you? The cops are still criminalizing you. They're still doing brothel raids and imprisoning you. A few weeks ago, some Romanian cis women were sent to jail for nine months after being prosecuted by the Gardaí. More sex workers are arrested this week in brothel raids. A lot of trans people go into the sex work industry because they face a lot of discrimination. Sorry, can people not hear at the back? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, a lot, of, a lot of trans people are more likely to go into sex work because they face a lot of discrimination in other areas of employment. So when the Gardaí crack down on sex workers, they're cracking down on some of the most vulnerable LGBT people, including the most vulnerable trans people, especially people of colour who are often forgotten when we talk about Pride today. On my way into town today, I was wondering why does it always make me feel so nervous and so uncomfortable? when I see rainbow advertising all over shops. I know I don't like it for sort of political reasons, but why does it make me feel physically nervous? And I realize the reason is that whenever I see that, it's not telling me I feel more welcome. It's telling me all the issues that I want to protest about at Pride are being depoliticized. We're stripping away all political connotations from Pride and we're forgetting about all the activism that still has to be done. We're acting as if after marriage equality and gender recognition, everything is taken care of. The state is no longer a, form, a source of discrimination or a vector for violence against the LGBT community. And it is. The state is still a source of discrimination and violence. When the Gardaí are still deporting people in direct provision and locking up sex workers and beating people up, there will always still be a need for pride to be political. For sex workers, for intersex people who are mutilated in Irish hospitals, have un medically unnecessary surgeries performed on them, when you have LGBT people fleeing discrimination in other countries and being locked up in direct provision here, there will always be a need for a political pride. I'd like us to remember that today. I'd like us to remember that two years ago, the government introduced new laws on sex work here that recriminalized and doubled the penalties on sex workers, where sex workers now go from a two and a half thousand euro fine or six months in prison for brothel keeping um, to 12 months in prison or 5,000 euro fine. That's not decriminalization, although that's how it was sold at the time. And that's not making trans people and LGBT people safer. So today, let's remember that there's still a lot of activism to be done. There's still a lot of the problems with the state, a lot of laws that need to be changed, and the fight is far from over. Thank you very much. <laughs> Um, next up, we have Alexa from Transgender NI. Um, Alexa Moore is a human rights activist based in Belfast and a director of Transgender NI, working primarily on access to healthcare, education, and gender recognition. I think it's kind of poetic that I am currently speaking over uh, Dublin Pride marching past us. I suppose I should start by talking about why we made the decision to attend this Pride rather than that one. And really it comes down to the lack of meaningful community involvement in the decision making around Dublin Pride. Marginalised groups within our community, people of colour, sex workers, refugees and asylum seekers are not being given the opportunity to have their voices heard and be meaningfully included in the organising of Pride. Pride has taken many decisions which directly negatively impact the community. 
including the guards and the PSNI, without consulting on the potential impact that would have on the community, isn't just ill-advised, it's violent. This is in the wake of news that a woman from Northern Ireland is facing prosecution for procuring abortion pills for her 15-year-old daughter. She will face trial in November. The PSNI are not our allies. <laughs> having Nestle, Tesco, Airbnb as corporate sponsors, having RTE as a media sponsor, we've seen the willingness of the mainstream media, in particular RTE, to throw trans people and other marginalised groups within the community under the bus. Their invitation to Graham Linehan to contribute to a discussion on trans people, a topic on which he has no experience, no qualification and no legitimacy. Merely <laughs> being a loud man and having opinions unfortunately does not qualify you to speak on everything. <laughs> but we're not just here to talk about Nestle or to talk about RTE. We're also here because we've all, in some way or another, have not been given space in Pride to raise our issues. Prides across Western capitalist countries have become pinkwashed, sanitized, devoid of political meaning or significance for so many in this community. And while we can work hard and try our best to make the mainstream prides listen to us and be inclusive and take account of our community's needs, sometimes it just doesn't work and enough is enough. <laughs> this event has shown that enough people are disillusioned with the pinkwashed corporate pride and that we need a new vehicle for change. We need a new vehicle to properly raise the issues affecting the trans and wider LGBT community. Nowhere is that clearer than right here in Dublin, right here in Ireland and especially in the North. There are a huge range of human rights violations perpetrated against the trans community in the North, which need to be addressed immediately. Many of these exist within our healthcare system. The Over 18's Gender Identity Clinic has not seen a new patient since January 2018. Their assessment model forces people to choose between access to healthcare and coming out and being forced out and being forced to maybe experience hate crime or homelessness or isolation because you have no choice about whether you socially transition or not before getting med medical transition. This puts people in so much danger and it shows the lack of care for trans people within our healthcare system. And I know it's the same down here. <laughs> we need best practice transitional healthcare delivered by GPs as much as possible on the basis of informed consent. It would solve a huge range of problems and begin to address the rapidly developing crisis in trans healthcare. Education is another area in which trans folks are hugely disadvantaged. Appropriate evidence-based and LGBT inclusive relationships and sex ed are not provided in schools in the North as a right. Proper inclusive education is a right and it cannot be based on individual board of governors or schools and their opinions on LGBT identities. Human rights should not be based on a postcode lottery or an air code lottery if you're from Dublin. Gender recognition, welfare reform, housing rights. There are so many issues harming the community in the North, compounded by the fact that we have no government willing to sort it out. The Irish government is failing LGBT folks in the North. The UK government is failing us. The executive parties in the North have and continue to que fail queers in the North. We need action, not meaningless platitudes, which is frankly all that they've been given us. If anything can be taken from this Dublin Pride alternative, let it be this. RTE have demonstrated that they are not our allies in our fight for liberation. Nestle, Tesco, Airbnb are not our allies in our fight for LGBT liberation. We are our allies. We are the grassroots, the LGBT community.
We can be allies of each other. We can stand in solidarity with each other in our intersecting experiences and our intersecting identities. Together, we can change Ireland.